Hey, First Christian Church, thanks for joining us to worship today. If you're new here, please stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby after the service is over. We would love the chance to meet you, as well as give you a gift to let you know how glad we are that you came to visit us today. Before we get started, we wanted to give you a look at some things coming up for you and your family here at FCC. Getting kids all the supplies and clothes they need for school, plus the cost of school registration, can be a financial burden for some families. You have the opportunity to bless children and families in our community to start the school year with a new backpack. We want to reach our goal of 300 brand new backpacks for our local children. You can start bringing backpacks at the beginning of July and you can drop them off in the big bus in the foyer. Guys, join us for the Men's Ministry Bags and Barbecue on Saturday, July 13th at 5 p.m. in the South Parking Lot here at the church. Come and get to know some of the other men at FCC and enjoy some good food. Here at FCC, we love ice cream and we love getting to hang out as one big family. So we thought we would combine the two for Sunday Fun Day. Mark your calendars and plan to join us on Sunday, July 14th at 5 p.m. in the Nichols Park Dining Hall by the playground. Make your favorite homemade ice cream or bring your favorite Ben and Jerry's to share. We will have lots of toppings to make some yummy Sundays. We hope to see you there. There are so many exciting things happening around FCC. Be sure to like us on Facebook and download our app to stay up to date with everything that is going on. Thanks again for joining us. Now let's all stand up and worship together. Good morning, church. Get our hands together, come on. Sing it with me. Get to my
can be seated. We are going to go into a time of communion where we remember Jesus' death on the cross. Here in just a second, the ushers are going to come forward and they're going to pass you the trays. And inside the trays, you'll find two cups. The bottom cup contains the bread and the top cup contains the juice. Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and partake and you can find a place for your empty cup on the seat in front of you. In his book, See You at the House, the late Bob Benson, he talked about how he hated recess whenever he was in school. He hated recess because the two best athletes always chose up the teams for softball, and Benson, he was a terrible athlete. He said, I was always chosen last, and the teacher would say, we're not going to play the game until somebody takes Bob. And he said, whenever they chose me, they always stuck me in right field, and I didn't even get to bat until I was in eighth grade. And he said, it's no wonder that I struck out. But in a really great section of his book, he talks about whenever he was chosen by God. He talks about realizing one day that God had chose him to hear the gospel. He writes, I wasn't chosen as a replacement for someone who didn't want to serve. I wasn't asked to play in the field that somebody was already covering. God saw me. He called me. He selected me. He picked me. He singled me out. He chose me, and that made all the difference. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, Even before he made the world, God loved us, and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So important that we remember that Jesus chose us, and he chose to die on the cross for our sin. And so today, as we gather for communion, we want to remember that sacrifice that Jesus made. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us enough to send Jesus to to die a gruesome death on the cross for our sins. And we come this morning, Father, to remember that sacrifice and to say thank you. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, we're going to continue to worship God this morning through our giving. Real quick, I want us to look at Leviticus chapter 23, or chapter 23, verse 22, because I think there's a great principle here that applies to our time of offering. In Leviticus 23, 22, it says, When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields, and do not pick up whatever the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. Now, why is it? Why did God tell these Israeli farmers that they, they couldn't harvest the whole field? You know, it didn't make a whole lot of business sense. It would be kind of the same as leaving money on the ground. But I believe that God was trying to teach them and teach us that we always need to leave space for God. You know, our tithing is just like that. And whenever we give 10% of our income back to the church, the world says that doesn't make sense. Why, why would you do something like that? But we need to be leaving that grain along the edges as well. You know, I, I, I don't think that God wants us to hold tightly to every single dollar that we make. Instead, he wants us to be like those Israeli farmers. He wants us to give the edges to him. And there's some people, they say, like, they, they think that that scripture might be talking about giving God your leftovers, and, you know, you shouldn't give God your leftovers. But I was thinking about it, but think about it. You can't get to the center of a field without going through the edges first. And God, he wants us to trust, uh, trust him with the first 10% of our income. You know, that's where the real blessing comes in. Whenever we tithe, we're allowing God the opportunity to move. We're allowing opportunities for ministry to take place. We're allowing God the opportunity to bless us. So today, as we give back to God, I want to encourage you to trust God when it comes to your finances. Let's pray. Father, you are so good. You have blessed us. You've blessed this church in so many ways, and we thank you for that, and we ask that you continue to move. Father, help us today to trust you with all the areas of our life, including our finances. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's just so real, so lifelike. Today I finish our series of sermons on the book of Jonah. We'll be exploring the fourth chapter, and in a moment or two we'll get down to it and uh, try and explain that it can be broken down into two sides, things that are unimportant and things that are important. <clears throat> I guess when we look at guys like Jonah, he's a diff little different, and I, I get to thinking, well, what's, what's normal? I mean, quite honestly, let's face it, even those of us that we call normal do a lot of abnormal things, don't we? Like, take, for instance, Friday. Friday, we hear the tornado sirens taking off, right? That means everybody comes in your house and gets down in your basement. What do you think I was doing? I went outside looking for a tornado. How many of the rest of you did that with me? There you go. A lot of odd people here today. How many of you have been, uh, take for instance, you swat your kid because he did something. He starts wailing and you go, you better shut that up or I'm going to give you something to cry about. Now, you wanted the kid to cry just a second ago. You would have kept whipping him until he did cry. But now that he's crying, you're wanting him to stop crying. 
How many of you have ever uh, looked for something? I was looking the other day for my iPhone, must have looked for it for two or three minutes, had it in my hand already. <laughs> and what about this? I've seen this happen to a lot of different people. A lot of uh, cultured and couth people even do this. You've got a head cold. It's winter. It's time to go ahead and how shall we say, dispatch our noses. And so we get a hanky out. Now you know what's in that hanky. And you know roughly what it looks like. And you know that if you look in there, it's disgusting, it's green, it's slimy, it's nasty. But what do you see people doing? They're like they're looking for a treasure. It's <laughs> we are an odd sort, are we not? And sometimes we're odd from this. God has made us in his image, and he has a set of values and a set of priorities, and there are things in the greater scope of things that he finds important and some that are unimportant, and for some reason we can't seem to get on the same page sometimes. We're odd, to say the very least. Sometimes we need a spiritual shakeup to go ahead and get ourselves realigned with him. To Jonah, it was a whale. I don't know what sometimes it takes for us, but sometimes it's an illness. Sometimes it's a death in the family. But sometimes in those rare moments when God's got our attention, we realign our priorities, and that's what's important. We're going to talk to you in chapter 4 here about things that are unimportant and things that are important, things that were unimportant back in the days of Jonah that are still that same way today because our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But before we get to reading chapter 4, why don't we pray? Father, I do pray that you would speak to us today, that you would use me as your vessel, that you would call us by your Holy Spirit in power to realign ourselves with you if we've gotten out of step. Father, just help us to learn from this fourth chapter, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 says that this change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. What change of plans? Well, if you go back to the first chapter in verse 2, God said, hey, I want you to go and announce judgment on those people. In other words, God was coming and he was going to do something radically. There was going to be a punishment. He was going to be punitive when it came to that. And so now all of a sudden, God has changed his mind because of Nineveh's repentance. And you would think that Jonah would be just elated. Any normal person would be. But here's his reaction starting in verse 2. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. And the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went out to to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away and as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. And then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah ret uh, retorted, even angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you feel sorry for a plant, though you didn't nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Should I, shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? 
Jonah and his priorities simply were not lined up with God's priorities, and I don't think that he's alone in that. Sometimes we seem to go into that far-off country like a prodigal, and we get ours all scrambled, our values as well. The first point is this, a lesson about things that do not matter. They didn't matter then, they don't matter now. Now, you won't like the first one. A is our opinions. Your opinion in the greater scheme of things, doesn't matter. There's many people that say, hey, if I'm a Christian, follow my heart. Do, what, you, do you know that the Bible says in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, verse 12, that there's actually a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death? Following emotions and how I feel about things is always a dangerous thing. This week, Madonna was on Australian TV, and during the interview... The subject of religion came up and they started talking in terms of abortion. And she was quoted as saying, let's talk about Jesus' point of view about women. Don't you think Jesus would agree that a woman has the right to choose what to do with her body? Don't you think? What's your opinion about it? It's not necessarily how much you've studied the Bible, how much you've prayed about it. It's don't you think? Don't I think? That seems to be something that because we've got such a hyperinflated view of our importance and our wisdom and our intelligence that we seem to think that our opinion matters. Our opinion does not matter. Jonah's opinion of the people of Nineveh was not a very good one. He actually said to God, it revealed his opinion in verse uh, two and, and uh, the second part of it. He says, I knew that you were a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. That was, in his opinion, not the right thing to do. He wanted them to have God call down fire from heaven. He wanted them a bunch of crispy critters. He did not care about the people of Nineveh. They were not worth anything in his mind. They were irredeemable and worthless. They were undeserving of any kind of mercy. They were reprobates in his mind. Job is trying to question God. And uh, in, in the book of Job, he's a good man. And Job had tragedy happen in his life. I mean, some terrible things. In the book of Job, he's trying to sort these things out. He just can't quite figure out why he's lived a righteous life, and yet some bad things are happening to him. And he develops an attitude that says, hey, this isn't right. It's my opinion that you're being unfair to me. And God uses four chapters to explain. Uh, summarized, it's this. Who do you think you are to offer your opinion a, a mere human being to me who is God. In verse 3 of Job 42, it says, Job speaking to God said, You asked, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. Jonah had strong opinions. Strong opinions as to the nature and what needed to be done to the people of Nineveh, and it did not line up with God's. Guess whose will trumps the other? Jonah was wrong. He seemed to think that he was right, but he was wrong. God's mercy and compassion trumped any opinion that Jonah might have had. These days we misunderstand something. We have talked for so long about Jesus being our Savior. We like the sound of that. We like the sound of grace. We like the sound of, of uh, it doesn't matter, you know, it's not saved by our works. So we assume that how we live and the choices that we make really don't matter. That's a very dangerous place to be. We under, misunderstand the concept of the Lordship of, of Christ. He's not going to be your Savior if he's not your Lord. The word Lord means the same thing that you think that it does. He's over us. He's got the power and the decision-making process over his opinion trumps anything that I might have. Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone that calls out to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. 
there's an idea that you might have opinions, and sometimes those opinions don't line up with Christ, and sometimes it doesn't seem like he makes sense to you. But still, we as Christians understand that Jesus Christ is still Lord. He is the one that determines the rightness or wrongness of the, something, whether something's good or bad. We seem to have relegated that to political circles now, issues of sexual preferences and abortion and all of those things. You know what? You and I have an opinion about that. We might totally disagree on that. You know how much that matters? Zero. My opinion, your opinion doesn't matter. Ultimately, there is a God that we all answer to, and our opinions don't matter. As, as much as we th find that statement distasteful, it doesn't matter. B is this, things or stuff don't matter. We like to have stuff to, to Jonah. It was this plant that was just temporary, this weed that grew out. And verse six says, and the Lord arranged for a leafy plant to grow there and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. And this eased his discomfort. And Jonah was very grateful for the plant. We most often are grateful for our creature comfort things. We like to have stuff makes our lives easier, is a sign of uh, our success, whether we have more stuff than the next guy might have. And I got an idea that he got his priorities so messed up because the plant, the thing, the thing that he took personal ownership that God said, hey, you didn't plant it, you didn't make it grow, and you didn't make it die. Why are you so upset about this thing when there are people down there that don't know their right hand from their left. They're in spiritual darkness. I can imagine as he's waiting for the judgment of God as he's looking down there on that city. It was important that he be comfortable and he was bemoaning the fact that those people were actually listening to his message. I can imagine him saying, hey, what a great plant. I like this weed. Look at how broad and plush these leaves are. I wish that God would kill all those people down below I hate those people, but I love me my weed. <laughs> Plant, that's another subject for another day. <laughs> there are things in our lives that get in the way of trying to listen to God as to what truly is important. Some of us hold on to our stuff, our things, way too much. Back when my family lived in Liberty before we came here, we were poor, and uh, yet for some reason I came up with a brilliant business move. I went out and bought a 67 Chevelle. We could no more afford that car than a man in the moon. And Janie, of course, was saying, whatever you say, my dear, it's great. She didn't quite go that way, but anyway. <laughs> I remember that after I bought it, that was just the initial expense. Then there was the expense of things like the air shocks and all sorts of stuff that I bought for it. And then we decided that we were gonna strip it down to the metal and, and repaint the thing. And I spent so much time on that thing, it became my idol. I loved that Chevelle. I remember that I was cleaning the car out in the back, I was leaned over and was cleaning something in the dirt and all of a sudden, boom, something hit the car. And I looked up and it was obvious that Justin had no idea that I was in that car but at five years old, he'd driven his tricycle into my 67 Chevelle. Now I got out and calmly said, like Ward Cleaver, son, I wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> I was ticked. I picked him up and I swatted his butt and I yelled at him. And I got to thinking afterwards, after I calmed down, you know, Jay, in a few years, you won't even have a clue where this heap is going to be. It's made of metal and plastic and rubber, and eventually it's going to be gone. And sure enough, it wasn't six months that I'd gone ahead and sold it to a young man in Quincy and never heard of it again. But my son, Justin's still my son. And I thought, you're paying so much attention. I think that he did it on purpose. I think that he realized that somehow I was allowing a thing, stuff, to get in the way of what was really important, that God had given me family, that he was important. 
There are things, however, that are critical, that are important. That's point two today. And A on that is obeying God. I mean, the whole point of Jonah 4 is God said, get up and go. He didn't say, hey, you're not getting up. I'm going to count to three. He just said, get up and go. And God meant get up and go. That was just what he meant. And the whole book is where Job is rebelling against what God is telling him to do. He was a formidable figure in my young life. My dad honestly was a man that when he said potato, I said potato. We just never quite saw eye to eye with each other. And every spring, my dad would plant a big garden. Notice I said the word plant. My brother and I who were in fourth and fifth grade and all the way through grade school were given the task of, of weeding it, of hoeing it, of watering it. That was our job. I remember being out there in that uh, garden and it was hot and we hated, we hated doing it. We could have cared less about vegetables. But nonetheless, we were always doing what dad had told us. Dad would say something like, hey boys, you better get up. It's uh, cool out there right now and, and you need to go out there and hoe. Didn't he know that it was summer and there was no school and it was just nine o'clock in the morning? I mean, for crying out loud, why would he be telling me? But, you know, we wouldn't dream of saying that because we were scared of our dad. And so we would get up, and it wasn't until a long time later that we realized that what he was telling me was for our own good. I hated it. My brother and me still laugh to this day. There were people constantly going up to dad, and some of them in front of us saying, Jim, you really put out a great garden. I thought, yeah, he puts out a great garden, yeah. You know, child labor laws, you ever heard of that? <laughs> As the years progressed and my dad got older, they lived in Missouri in the country and dad had five acres and he would have Tim and me come to the house. And every time that we came to the house, he had this big long list of things that needed to be done. Some of them the most ridiculous things you ever heard, but you know what, we did the list. We didn't do the list anymore because we were afraid of him, but because out of love and respect for him through the years, there was a different thing that impelled us from that moment on. You know, God sometimes tells us to do things and we don't understand it, or else we do understand it and want to rebel against it. Sometimes he's telling us, hey, you better get up and hoe while it's cool. The Bible tells us in 1 John, the fifth chapter, verses two and three, we know that we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. When we learn to, to follow his wisdom, when we learn to follow his way, when we learn to obey him, Things shift. At first, it's a, gee, I have to. It's rules. Follow the rules. And we see that through the years, there's a wisdom in everything that he asks us or tells us to do. And his commandments are not burdensome. The second thing, B, is people. That's what matters, people. Remember the old song, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. All the children, all the children of the world. You know that it's not an option for you or me to be selective as to who we care about. We are defined by our love. Jesus, when he was getting ready to leave, talked to his disciples. And there was something fascinating. He said in John, the 13th chapter, verse 35, he said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Another translation says, the world will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. He didn't say you'll be, the world will know you're my disciple if you make sure that you don't cuss or that you make sure that you don't rob bag, uh, banks or beat your wife or kick your dog. He said, they're going to know that you're a disciple if you love people, if you love one another, he's not talking about loving people who necessarily love you and treat you well. Look at the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, what difference does it make? Even the heathens will love people that love them. 
they'll pay respects to those who pay respect to them. What do you more than that, more than others? And it's important that we realize in the, the book of Jonah, if there's anything that really needs to be an important lesson to us, it's the fact that people, regardless of how indecent they might seem, people matter to God. Do they matter to you? Our church can be defined by many things. Gee, it's a praying church. Gee, it's a church that's doctrinally sound. Gee, it's a big church. Gee, it's a church with lots of young people, with kids. Best thing, best compliment that they could ever pay us. Is this a group of people that they come from different backgrounds? And some of them come from poor backgrounds, some of them from rich backgrounds, some of them from the opposite side of the tracks, uncultured, and some of them very cultured. And they have figured out a way to genuinely love one another. You know, the greatest compliment to him. They would know we're disciples by the way that we treat the unlovable. One of the things that I was so proud of First Christian Church was the simple fact that back in years ago in the old church building, we had a thing we called the butt hut. The butt hut was where the smokers went out just a little ways away from the back door. We had people from Well Center that were coming in and all of them smoked and they were smoking by the back door and when you walked in, you smelled like a Marlboro and people didn't like smelling like that. And so we furnished a hut, a butt hut, out farther. There were lots of churches that said, we don't want those type of people here. We don't like those kind of people. We were one of the only churches, I'm not gonna say exclusively the only, but they certainly knew that we were a place that they could come as a prodigal they could come home. We, we loved people that other churches didn't love. Jesus saying, hey, your love for one another is going to prove to the world. It's the thing that will make you distinct from the rest of the world. James, the second chapter, verse one says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? On average, two people die every second in this world. Every 61 seconds, someone is murdered. Every 39 seconds, someone commits suicide. Every 26 seconds, someone dies in a car wreck. Every three seconds, a child under the age of five dies. The majority of those people die without Christ, having ever heard of Christ. Now, those are numbers to you, but that's somebody's dad. That's somebody's mom. That's somebody's child. That's somebody's grandma or grandpa. That's somebody's friend. And the sad thing is that in the time that I've been talking to you about these averages, from the moment I read the first line, two people die every second in the world, well over 60 people have died in our world without hope in Jesus. And here's an unsettling truth. If we're honest today, you don't give a damn. You really don't give a damn. I mean, wouldn't we do something wouldn't it make a big difference to us if we really believe we're hoping that somehow God's going to overlook our loved ones and he's going to show grace to them. Maybe we're a misunderstanding that it's not exclusivity through Jesus Christ. Any number of things. The truth is those people have died. Now somewhere in the neighborhood of 120. And you don't give a damn. You know what's really sadder? You care more about the fact that I use the word damn than the now 196 people that have died without Christ. People matter. 
They matter to God. They've always mattered to God. Early in June of 1995, the nation held its collective breath, waiting to discover the faith of a 29-year-old Air Force captain by the name of Scott O'Grady. He flew his F-16 over Bosnia on a, a routine patrol and the Serbs fired a missile and it ripped his plane in half. At the last second, of course, he was able to launch free, but he landed in a wooded area down below for six days. He hid in the woods away from the enemy, surviving only on grass and ants to eat. Occasionally, he would send out a signal from a low-powered radio, hoping that the enemy wouldn't be able to identify where he was, but hoping that home would find his way to, through his GPS. Back in the States, the government officials weighed the costs of sending in a rescue team to locate the pilot. They asked questions like this, how much would it cost in fuel? What's the potential loss of further equipment? Was it worth risking the lives of other people? The mission certainly would be very dangerous. They finally arrived at this. It was worth it. That the value of saving one life outweighed all the other potential costs. Lives matter. People matter. Tracing O'Grady's signals as a guide, the rescue team flew into his general location and in seconds, they had him in a helicopter headed home for safety. People matter. You know, as we end this thing on Jonah, let me tell you another truth. You have an Nineveh. You have people that don't know Christ, that you know very well, that you probably have the best chance of at least getting them interested in finding hope in him. Might be your family, might be your friends, might be someone that you don't even like. It certainly was that for Jonah, but rest assured, you have a Nineveh. Does it matter enough to you to be able to come out of a comfort zone and to say what little needs to be said it takes so little sometimes to get people moving in the right direction do we care enough about our Nineveh the second thing is this some of you are Nineveh you've drifted off you don't know exactly how you left a path that you once held and your your relationship with Christ was so close but it's gone now. Something happened. Maybe you know exactly what it was. But you find yourself away from his will and needing terribly to repent and turn back to him. We're about to sing a song. We have prayer benches up here. And if you have someone that you need the courage to talk to them about Christ, to try and at least invite them to a church where they'll hear about Christ, if you need that courage, if you need that strength, come up and give those names to him. If you've been in that far off country for a long time and know that you need to find your way back, his invitation is extended to you today as well. Would you say yes as we stand and as we sing?
Declare this with me. 